So it looks like the technology is just about set. So um, let's go ahead and start. Welcome, everyone. I'm Carol Runyon. I'm a faculty member in the School of Public Health and School of Medicine and director of the Pediatric Injury Prevention Education Research Pipers Program, which is the sponsor of this seminar. Before I introduce today's speaker, though, I want to draw your attention to two other seminars that may be of interest. Tomorrow, um, sponsored by the Department of Epidemiology, Dawn Comstock, who's right here in the green shirt, will be speaking about her work on high school sports-related injury and data that she has available for sharing and development of new projects. Um, and then our next seminar in this series will be April 25th, Lorraine Salins from Colorado State and the, from the School of Public Health. Um, we'll be presenting on some aspect of occupational injury. We're not sure of the exact topic yet, but mark your calendar and plan to come. So today's presentation um, is on the trauma care system, and our guest is Dr. Jerry Jerkovich, who arrived here in Denver about a year ago as the director of trauma at Denver Health and also is um, vice chair of the Department of Surgery here in Colorado. He spent the last, I'm working backwards, spent uh, the last 24 years at, um, in Seattle at University of Washington and Harvard View Medical Center, um, where he was involved in their injury research center and a variety of other things. Um, before that, he trained at, in medicine at University of Minnesota. Um, told me today he had a brief stint at Duke. Uh, which I told him I might not mention, given that I'm from Chapel Hill in Carolina, and <laughs> there's a little bit of rivalry, particularly during March Madness, but, you know, we won't go there. Um, and, but did his residency here in Colorado, so he's, in a way, come home again. So I'm very pleased that he's here to talk about trauma care in Colorado and hopefully start a lively discussion about the topic. Thanks. Thanks, Carol. Thanks. Let's see, I'm, I may be tied to this podium for um, the um, recording issue, so I apologize for that. Otherwise, I would maybe mingle a little bit. Um, so I'm a trauma surgeon. I'll probably start with this part. The word injury and the word trauma are um, frequently used to describe the same thing just by dis different disciplines. This looks like an injury discipline, and I come from the trauma discipline for the most part. It's really, it's a little bit of a mix of both, Carol. Not really a difference between the two, but we're talking about physical force applied to the body, uh, causing damage to the organs of the body and disrupting the health of the person. We call that injury or trauma. It's the, it's the same thing. We're talking about the same thing here. I outlined today, I, I've uh, been working on this for a while um, in a variety of different formats, and, I, and I'm... I'm going to beg your indulgence when I get to this, toward the end of this talk outline. I'm, most of you probably know this quite well, but I do want to begin with this introduction about trauma being a public health problem. And that, I think that has fundamentally changed the way we view injury and its management is by putting it in the model of a public health problem, not so much a direct medical care problem, but an overall public health model. We haven't been particularly effective at that in terms of receiving the amount of funding that's proportionate to the level of impact it has on a population. But I think in terms of trying to diminish the burden of injury on society, that's been a very effective role. So I want to talk a little bit more about that. I'll give you some background a little bit to the healthcare system we have in the country overall, and in particular talk about the way um, a variety of different things have influenced the delivery of that care, and most notably the finances of it. Now, I want to make the point that regionalization of healthcare, getting away from the um, uh, community physician, your local doc, more to regionalize healthcare, is one of the proposed solutions to many of the problems facing global healthcare. And try to make the point that, in some ways, the way that trauma care has evolved in this country is the best example we have of effective regionalization of care. Uh, it's been tried in many other areas with intermittent success, but I think in trauma care, it's had great success in that part. And it's a model, I think, for how that regionalized care can be done. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to get any further than that in today's session, but I'm going to end on time. Uh, but I've asked Carol if I could come back for sort of part two of this, where I'm hoping I'll leave you with some questions about how well does the state of Colorado and its health care delivery system for trauma care meet the idealized needs of regionalized trauma care 
what are its holes, what's missing, what research opportunities are available, what questions are left unanswered. And I'll leave that a little bit with a comparison in particular between where I spent the last 24 years, the state of Washington, and was instrumental in developing its trauma program, and how Colorado shares many of those attributes, but in my mind um, is significantly different in a few key ones. And like many biological systems, well, you can be very similar for most things, but if you're different in just a couple little genome sequences, it can change the entire uh, construct of what the end organ looks like. And I think that's the difference between Colorado and Washington. But we may not get to that to part two. Uh, every talk should begin with a disclosure, right? Um, I, and I think this is fair. I am employed by Denver Health and Hospitals. I am also academically affiliated with the uh, University of Colorado School of Medicine. Don't know whether that really constitutes a disclosure in terms of the classic form of getting money from a drug company when you speak about their product. Um, but I get all my money from Denver Health, uh, and it is one of the level one trauma centers, so we should be upfront about that part of that. The burden of injury care, leading cause of death up to the age of 44 in this country. So for most of you here, that's going to be the main reason you die. You're going to take your bicycle out there. You're going to ride on an icy street. You're going to be hit by a bus. I'm going to see you laying down with a bad head injury, and I'm going to try my best to take care of you. But 5% of you will die from that part. That's the leading cause of death in Colorado for people under the age of 44 that I'm going to see. Uh, after 44, it's falls. It's uh, getting up on a roof and trying to put the Christmas tree lights in the ice and slipping off the ladder and then bonking your head while you're on Plavix or an anticoagulant, which I can't reverse, and you die of a head injury. Put those two together, that constitutes about 50% of the mortality I see. In this state and city, the other 50% is penetrating violence. And that's just the way it is in this state. So this pictogram from the CDC's most recent uh, webpage site uh, gives you an illustration of the burden, if you will, of number of deaths from injury compared to com non-communicable diseases, compared to the infinitesimally small infectious disease, at least in this country, in the United States, or relative to injury. I think many of you have seen this. If you haven't, a classic CDC diagram they've been putting out for about a decade, which lists in rank order up from up and down on this side. I don't know if I have a pointer here or not. I'm afraid that if I push something, it's going to burst. Have a pointer, you sir? Use the clicker or the um, mouse. As a yeah, you don't know either, right? Yeah, if I do that, what happens? No. If I do this, yeah, that's not good. Anyway, so up and down the left-hand side rank order, first through tenth uh, in the, uh, thanks. I don't know if my turning around will do it, but thanks. Rank order, first through tenth, all the way down in what's the most important disease, and across the top, your age groups. Less than one year of age, one to four, five to nine, four to and so on, up to the age of greater than 65. The blue represents unintentional injury deaths. This is the number of deaths in those age groups. The blue, unintentional injury deaths. Of course, what they, you know, we used to call them accidents, right? But in trauma and injury, there's no such thing as an accident. It means it's unpreventable. And in fact, every injury-related death can be prevented by either active or passive or means of preventing them. So blue is unintentional. Green is suicide. Red is homicide. So you can see the dominance of injury-related deaths over these first decades of life. Now, in 1995, that long ago, right? 10, 15, 17, 18 years ago, there were 92,000 trauma deaths from unintentional injuries, 55,000 homicides, roughly 18 million disabling entries, and that annual direct medical care cost was $78 billion. It's from the National Safety Council in 95. Well, most recently, data from 2010, see a large increase in that. The population's increase, of course, for up to 310 million overall, but a greater than 180,000 deaths from injury every year in the United States. One person dies every three minutes. And over this talk, from injury, in the United States, 20 people will die of injury while we're here sitting in this room overall in the United States. I mentioned it already as a leading cause of death, and in fact, just barely, but over 50% of the deaths in that age group is from injury. 2.5 million hospitalized, way more, 10 times, 15 times more, are treated in emergency departments and released. Relatively minor injuries, but still they represent a huge burden on health care dollars, both including that around $100 billion of it in direct medical care expenses and another $350 billion in lost wages, since these are the most productive years of life. This is a huge burden on society, up to $500 billion, half a trillion 
in annual health care costs. Uh, and this uh, makes an effort, uh, make, sorry, go back, makes a little point about those of fatal, hospitalized, non-hospitalized, the incidence of medical costs, et cetera. Bottom line, nearly $500 billion, half a trillion dollars in direct medical care costs and in productive lost wages due to uh, injury. If you begin on the green, or being in the black, this is the youngest, you move your way around to older populations, you can see this great part here is those work-related years. Those are people uh, between the ages of 15 and 65. The vast majority of that reason for those lost wages, those expenses, is because it most commonly occurs and those are their most productive years of life. That's where the greatest cost uh, comes from. Well, cause of motor vehicle crashes, uh, this is in 2006. Actually, uh, uh, 2010, this graph changed where motor vehicle crashes were number one, but now falls are the number one cause. Uh, the, these have shifted. Uh, as the population has aged, the incidence of falls has increased. And as more people are on anticoagulants, the incidence of devastating head injuries from those falls has increased. As motor vehicles have become safer, uh, as a, 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 a passive restraint devices uh, have improved on motor vehicles and their engineering has improved, you see a decrease in those motor vehicle deaths, including drunk driving laws and speed limit laws. So motor vehicle deaths has fallen, falls have increased, and now falls are the number one cause of death um, from injuries across the country. You can see the relative mix in there as well for the rest of them. All right. Now, nothing in healthcare matters if it isn't about the money. Uh, there's, there should be probably no mistake about that, and the money dominates this discussion, in part because we spend so damn much money on healthcare. And since trauma and injury accounts for 50% of all those costs in the first 44 years of life, it's a significant influence on how much we spend in healthcare. Now, maybe many of you have seen this, but our per capita expense in the United States far exceeds other developed nations. Right? Our per capita, $7,500 per person for 310 million people in the United States per year on health care dollars. Compare that to Japan, spends $2,700 on per capita health care. Our percent of gross domestic product in the United States spent on health care is over 16%, 17% this past year. That compares to 8% for Japan, 9% for the United Kingdom, Australia, Austria. We spend dramatically more part of our gross domestic product on health care than any other developed nation. Now, it would be one thing, uh, and on top of that is growing exponentially. You can see it growing much faster than other developed nations, including Switzerland and Sweden and the United Kingdom, all of which have health care. So that would be one thing if we we're getting bang for the buck, but, but the reality of it is that Reality of is that we're not. Although we do very well, we're yellow. This is money spent, and this is health of the population for life expectancy. So we don't have the highest life expectancy. That's reserved for Japan. But we sure spend the most. Go USA. Go USA. <laughs> we spend the most. But we get about the same relative life expectancy as Chile, Mexico, Cuba. Costa Rica, Portugal, yet spending an exponential amount of dollars more on that health care cost. Now, this one isn't quite the fairest. This has to deal with the uh, um, infant mortality in the United States compared to other countries. We spend a lot on, on uh, your left-hand side. We don't get that much bang for the buck. You look at our infant mortalities on the right-hand side. Uh, ranks down there fairly low. And those are, what, those are some of the criticism that exists for American health care delivery service. Now, you've heard a lot about the national debt, and I know you've seen some of this data, but this plays into the issue of the delivery of trauma care and delivery of injury care in the country. Our U.S. national debt, uh, I looked at the clock this morning, $16,700,000,000. And if you actually go to the website and look at the debt clock, it, the numbers look like roll really fast on there. It's, it's pretty scary, actually, looking at it. You know, they got the sequestered clock next to it and how much money you're saving, but it doesn't keep up with how much is being spent. And it just it goes like this. It's, it's kind of panicky. Well, our gross domestic product is just over $15 trillion. It went up from $14 trillion just last year. So we're at about 100%. Our debt to expense ratio is about 1 to 1, about 100%. So we're at 105 now, uh, Cyprus, you hear a lot about in the news lately, it's causing the market to sort of stall, Japan to panic, is about 
debt ratio of 75%. They're actually better off than we are. Ireland's the worst. 1,300%. They got a lot of debt, and they have no gross domestic product. I mean, how many potatoes can you sell you know, when you're borrowing money? So that's a problem. They try really hard, but they're not making it. United Kingdom, 400%, four times their debt to their gross domestic product ratio. Those are staggering numbers. European Union, 93%, about the same as us. But Russia, India, and China, no debt relative to their gross domestic product. So the, these, are the, these are the kind of things that drive financiers crazy in terms of our economy, is our debt ratio and how are we ever going to pay for it. If you, if you, the, the numbers on this are pretty staggering. The uh, Cyprus debt is about $7,000 per person in the country right now. The United States debt per person is about $57,000 for each one of us to make up our debt. That's what it is in the United States. Now, this isn't the highest we've ever been. I'll get over this little thing in just a little bit here, but bear with me. This isn't the highest we've ever been. The highest was right after the end of World War II and World War I. Uh, and the lowest in the most recent memory was in the 1974 and 1978 and 1981. And lest you think this has anything to do with the political commentary, I submit it doesn't. The red bars are when there were Republican presidents. The blue bars are when there were Democratic presidents. The blue bar across the bottom is when Congress was controlled by Democrats. The red bar was when Congress was controlled by Republicans. And I'll submit you to try to make any sense of this from a political standpoint of when we have a lot of debt or when we have a little bit of debt. It looks pretty independent of who's running, whether it's the Congress or the company. It has much more to do with other factors than then just that part of it. All right, well, the important part about this is probably not sustainable having a country have that much debt, probably not sustainable having a country spend that much of its gross domestic product, 20%, on health care. If you're trying to cut your expenses and 20% of it goes to health care, you're going to try to find a way to cut your health care expenditures. And some of those ways to cut health care expenditures are listed here. This was a bilateral debt commission reduction that only got rid of $200 billion. not much, but got rid of some. But some of the key points of here, cut federal graduate medical education, Expand accountable care organizations and payment bundles. Accelerate cuts to disproportional share hospitals. Cut Medicare payments for bad debt. And place dual patients in managed care plans. These are just some of the plans that all have to deal with really impacting how health care is delivered. Now, my organization, American College of Surgeons, takes a careful look at this because it looks at the role of surgical manpowers and gets, looks at the role of how it can provide medical care in this changing environment. This last year, this policy panel that they have looked at the Health Care Reform Act and talked about what are the implications of this for the future. And they made these predictions, and they're not really predictions, they're obvious trends. There's a whole body of literature to support this, but the trends are like this. There's clearly a shortage of surgical workplace in the country that's getting worse. Primarily, that's because fewer medical students entering medicine are going into surgery. Secondly, it's because of the aging population of the surgeons that do exist and they're getting out of the workforce. And thirdly, it's because 50% of the entering workforce in medicine is women, and the same proportion of that are entering into surgery. And by and large, their lifestyle and practice of surgery is different than a generation ago's male practice in surgery. It's not nearly as dominant, all-consuming, 100% of the time. It's either spotty or intermittent or part-time. So the combination of those really have decreased the surgical manpower workforce. Hardest hit in this is rural America, where there's a severe shortage of surgeons, general surgeons, the bread and butter surgeons, provide medical care for rural America. We'll see where this goes with us. Furthermore, the most recent graduates are most interested in the high technological medicine, high impact, high inspective, game playing, toy playing, Nintendo game playing surgery. That's only going to be concentrated in regional urban centers. But yet the purpose of, or the hope rather, maybe a better way to put it, of regionalization is that this concentration somehow is going to be more cost effective as well as providing superior quality. This then gets at the concept of trauma regionalization. How effective has trauma been at regionalizing healthcare? Is it cost effective? Does it provide good quality of care? All right, so there's the, the background for this. All right, now. Regionalization care is not a brand new idea, of course. Uh, 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 I would say Harold Luft, uh, 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 writing in 1979, talked about this topic of 
highly specialized technical procedures operations and should they be regionalized. He came up with the concept that the empirical relationship between surgical volume and mortality was real. Now th th this is intuitive, right? The more you do, the better you're going to get it. Practice makes perfect. The more you do something, I mean, we all have that experience. There's probably nothing that we don't know that we don't. The more we do, the better we are at it. The more we run, the better we are at running. The more we ski, the better we are. The more we fly fish, the better we are. The more fish we're going to catch. Think of some things that the more you do, the worse at it you get. There's got to be some. Carol? The more you cook, the more butter you use. What else? <laughs> <laughs> But, I mean, it's, an, it's intuitive to us that that makes sense. Harold Luff uh, and others following in that have clearly shown this relationship be true. Uh, John Berkmeyer, a surgeon in, from Vermont, has, has really hallmarked this. But he came about a decade later than the other guys, Harold Luff in particular, writing about volume, the relationship between volume and outcome. And, and although these are a little bit small, I'll just carry you through these a little bit. Uh, um, carotid endarterectomy. Extremity bypass, abdominal aortic aneurysms, coronary artery bypass. These are all cardiovascular operations. And as you go from a small volume to a higher volume, in every one of these, the mortality falls. And, and, and it's almost linear. The higher volume you do, the lower your mortality. This is true both, this is an important point, both for the individual surgeon as well as for the hospital together. That debate rages right now, actually, is which one is more responsible for it, the hospital or the individual surgeon. The current data support suggests it's more of the hospital than it is the individual surgeon, but that data is still inconclusive. But nonetheless, the idea being that you need a whole support structure, and you need to do a lot of it, and if you do more of it than somebody does a little bit of it, you're going to get better. It's true for cardiovascular operations. It's true for all the thoracoabdominal operations, colectomy, gastrectomy, esophagectomy, pancreatic resections. It's the one being touted the most here at the University of Colorado right now with Rich Schulich, the new chair coming from Hopkins where he did a lot of pancreatic surgery. Look at this difference here from six, a mortality rate of 16% down to 3% where they do a high volume versus low volume of pancreatic operations. Nephrectomy, cystectomy, lobectomy, anything big and most of you wouldn't know what big is, but most surgeons would understand what big is in an intuitive sense of what a big operation is. Knows that the bigger the operation is and the more of it you do, the better off you're going to get. And whether, again, whether it's the surgeon or the hospital, it remains some debate. Now that, now that data, that incidence, that, that intuitiveness would make it clear that while we should really concentrate, let's take trauma here, we should concentrate our most severely injured and our sickest patients at a few centers. We're bound to get better outcome with those patients. And you can say that for cancer. You could say that for cardiac disease. You could say that for vascular disease. You could say that for a whole bunch of things. There is some risk in this, however, and here's some of the risk. Best illustrated by this article, um, uh, Karen Sitzenberg has written about this a number of times, but this one article is pretty good. And what it says is the following, that if you provide, if the high volume centers are only getting the best insured, the highest socioeconomic class, the patients who can afford to move, the patients who can stay in a hotel where they're getting their health care someplace else, patients who have a car, patients who have good nutrition, if your high volume centers are only doing those patients and your low volume centers are caring for the most high risk patients, your population improvement is nil from a population standpoint. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. The classic picture of those who can afford to go, those who have good health care anyway, those who have got the good quality of life, those who have got good resources, they have good family background, they have good support. They're being referred to the regional centers. The regional centers are going to look great, and everyone else is going to look terrible. And so the regional centers are going to be applauding themselves, but the population of the whole state, or a whole region, or the whole country, you've gained nothing but driving up costs and expense of pushing these people around and moving people around. That's what this data says. Patients with high-risk characteristics, and in this study it was black race, poverty level, and socioeconomic insurance status, were more likely to be treated at low-volume centers and have a worse outcome than high volumes. Gender didn't matter in this. North Carolina. See that on there? Yeah. Okay, good. It's not just in the United States either. This uh, uh, Ingemar Ilse, um uh, gave this talk to the European Surgical Association just last year and talked about the volume outcome relationship in cancer surgery. 
Well, it's true across the world he made these points. Hospital team volume and surgeon expertise matter worldwide. No question about it. But to make it happen for everyone, intrusive regulation is required. Come back to this maybe next visit. Because intrusive regulation is not high on the list of the priorities of the Colorado legislature. But intrusive regulation is what's needed to make regionalization required. Traveling is a problem. And while the data is compelling, it perhaps is not quite definitive enough to really force those intrusive regulations to happen. All right. Let's go with trauma care now. Regionalized trauma care. It works and it saves lives. The concept behind trauma care, the regionalization of trauma care and trauma centers, is, is based on this old adage of the golden hour. The idea that you had a roughly an hour from the time of your injury until you had definitive repair, basically that you patched a hole in whatever was bleeding, that you had that hour, and that the body could generally withstand that insult for about an hour. But if you could get them from the time of their injury until they had definitive care within an hour, you were golden, the patient was golden. That broke down into rules of 20-20-20, that is 20 minute response time, 20 minute on the scene time, and 20 minute transport time for how EMS agencies would work. They broke that down even further into 8-8 eight, eight, and 8 to try to get them in within a half an hour so that the ER would have a half hour to do their thing before definitive care would happen. And so that's where this concept came from. Now, the military's played a huge role in this. Let's just look at, let's go back and American history a little bit. Let's go back in the Civil War. Civil War, transport time wasn't measured in minutes, wasn't measured in hours, it was measured in days. It's because it was drawn by horse buggy carts. From the time of injury until he got back to a battlefield hospital was about three days. And the horses were the ambulance and the mortality from an injured, if you didn't die immediately, the mortality from your injury was 25%. We use that as a benchmark, a 100-year benchmark for the country. World War I saw the uh, introduction of motorized vehicles. The first ambulances in the field were used. And that was about the only difference. But transportation time was cut down from days to hours. And mortality went from 25% down to 8% in World War I. Actually, if you think about it, World War, that's pretty remarkable. Injury mortality in World War I, 8%. World War II, a lot of things happened besides the motorized vehicles, but there were more widespread use of ambulances, there were better trained medics, there were the use of plasma and antibiotics for the first time, and the field hospitals were put a little bit closer to the front, not quite so close, but still closer. Transportation time cut in half, mortality time cut in half. Now we're down to 4%. That's actually an enviable overall mortality for any trauma center in the country is under 5%, basically World War II data. Now at the same time, this is what healthcare was in the United States. That's what the military was doing. This represents, you notice, uh, very careful controlling of the cervical spine so you don't have any injury here and the, the sort of transport vehicle and the vehicle in the back, you know, I recognize that's the hearse from the local coroner, that was the local ambulance. Healthcare delivery for the civilian population wasn't quite keeping up with what was happening in the military. This was the status of healthcare in the 30s and 40s in the United States. Along comes the Korean War in 55 where a real jump was made with the use of helicopter and the MASH unit, the Ford Mobile Army Surgical Hospital being put in the front lines. Transportation time cut down in half again. Mortality cut down in half again. An, uh, an enviable mortality that we can't reach in urban trauma centers now at 2.5%. MDs, medics, and MASHs, that was a big deal there. What was happening at the same time in the United States? Well, the United States was just realizing mobile intensive care units in the United States. They're just being done where they would send out physicians because there weren't medics yet, they weren't back yet from the war, to the field to take care of patients. And it all began because of the availability not of trauma care, but of mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation being identified in the early 1960s by a guy named Peter Safar, being able to take some back from a cardiac arrest and resuscitate them with mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. That stimulated the development of ambulances, mobile ambulances in the United States for civilian tra trauma. Well, the Vietnam War was certainly a hallmark of what we were able to accomplish from that standpoint. Mortality under 2%, transport time 27%, moving directly from the field out to battleship hospitals in, in the, sitting in the Gulf, and uh, care was great then. So the chronology, 1958, mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, invented, shown that it was affected by Peter Safar. 1966, the first white paper published by the National Academy of Sciences that looked at injury care in the United States and neglected disease in the United States until 1966. 
fact, that was the title of it, Accidental Death and Disability. Note the word accidental. Death and Disability, the Neglected Disease. That single white paper stimulated a bunch of federal funding, the most important of which it was in 1972, the EMSS Act, which actually designed, developed, and built to date the same EMS regions that exist in every state in the country. Every state's divided into a number of EMS regions, designed in 1972, funded in 1972. Each of those regions gets money from the federal government to build ambulances, train medics, supply their ambulance, put stuff on their rigs. That was the genesis of all of our regional EMS, was that one paper. Uh, and nearly coincident with that, at the same time, the American College of Surgeons in 1976 got into the business, if you will, and developed the first document called Optimal Resources for Care of the Injured Patient. And about every four or five years since then, this book has turned into the Bible of how trauma care should be delivered in your hospital and in your region and in your center. So they've, the American College of Surgeons, a professional organization, um, took over this role uh, in concert with the federal government to a large part, but largely because they were deemed the experts in this, and developed this entire documentation and protocolization and standardization of what you should have in your hospital what resources you should be able to provide, and what your regional system should look like providing care. Importantly, they changed the name. In 1976, it was called Optimal Hospital Resources, so it really focused on what your hospital should have. In 1990, they changed it to more globally. This said Optimal Resources for Care of the Injured Patient. Got out of just the hospital business and got much more into the systems business as well. All right. So... Do trauma centers work? Do trauma centers save lives? What's the evidence? Well, the evidence really falls into three large categories. I'll summarize it here in a couple of slides. Uh, in a, a consensus conference held in 1998, a lot of players funded by the CDC at that time in uh, Skamania, Oregon, a little resort town outside of Portland. Um, and, and I looked at all the data up to that point, 1998, that, that, that supported the existence of trauma centers and trauma systems. And that support comes in uh, three different categories. One, I'll call preventable death studies. The second, we'll call registry comparison studies. And the third, we talk about population comparisons. I'll show you an example of each of those, but each of them have remarkably similar overall outcomes, which show between a 15 and 20% mortality reduction in the most severely injured patients by trauma centers and trauma system being in place. The preventable death study goes like this. You have a panel of experts that comes into your hospital. They take all the deaths you've had from injury over the last year. They look at all those deaths and they say, wow, you guys really screwed up here. And this much percent of these deaths could have been prevented with good care. No question. About it. And the number rose uh, really as high as 30, 40, 70 percent of the trauma deaths were preventable. The classic paradigm of this is a ruptured spleen that wasn't recognized, was put in a ward, bled to death before anyone recognized it. That was the most common paradigm. Second most common paradigm was a perforated intestine that nobody recognized until they got very septic and sick and ill, and then they died of that sepsis. Those are the two most common non-head injured paradigms of preventable trauma deaths. Then the hospital made some changes, and that same panel would come back in a year or two or three years later and look at their preventable mortality after that. And invariably, here's examples from San Diego, from Los Angeles, from Tampa, Florida. Uh, there were about 52 of these studies done over a 20-year time period, over two decades, and they all showed the same thing, this dramatic change in preventable mortality from before and after system changes were in place. That was point number one. Coincident with that, uh, the American College of Surgeons developed a national trauma registry. It took about 115 hospitals, initially called the Major Trauma Outcome Study, 1982 to 89, subsequently turned into the National Trauma Data Bank, but initially consisted of about 100 hospitals and now expanded to more than that, where you turn in all your data from your trauma patients. You had to have a registry. You had to have the registry. You had to have fixed components. Those components were defined by the American College of Surgeons. You had to have a registrar that did it. You enter that data in pool all that data in the country and develop national norms. Then you compare yourself to the national norms. And invariably, before you had a trauma program, before you were a trauma hospital, you compared your outcomes to the national norm, you were worse. 
You invariably, after you developed some of these protocolizations and plans and became a trauma center, you invariably became as good, if not better, than a national norm. Those still hold to do. The National Trauma Data Bank has a rolling one million patients in it. It rolls over every year. It adds a new and kicks out an old one, so it's contemporary. It's in the last five years. One million patients, almost all from level one and level two trauma centers in the country. The, the only problem with it is it has no data checks on the validity or accuracy of it. It's, it's, it's because it's too expensive to do it. So you're trusting the hospitals to put in their own accurate data, but it's still widely used as a benchmark comparison. The last set of data is a population comparison. Classic example, you take the state of Washington, you take the state of Colorado, similar size, geography, number of patients, compare the outcome of the whole patient population for mortalities in the two states, and you see what their difference is. And those, those of course, are lacking any um, granularity of the uh, uh, health care, of what actually was provided then, but you get a good picture of the overall health care. This one, uh, two by Rich Mullins and myself. Rich Mullins uh, and I were had the same role in Washington versus Oregon. I was a trauma director for the level one in, or in Washington. He was a trauma director for level one in Oregon. We were friends from a long time ago, so we did these comparisons between our two states. We looked at them, and what Oregon did, they went from 18 hospitals providing trauma care down to two. And at the same time, Washington had no trauma system. It was just go wherever you want to go, see what happens, no organized healthcare system. And overall, we showed that you could concentrate the most severely injured at the level <laughs> one trauma centers in Oregon. And overall, the population of the state of Oregon did better than the state, uh, then did better than the state of Washington over that time period. And bottom line there, lower relative risk of death for Oregon residents than in Washington. That, those two papers stimulated the Washington legislature to develop a trauma system legislation for the state of Washington because of that comparison. It was like, well, we're, we can't be worse than Oregon. Those ducks, they're ducks. They're, they're, they're hicks, they're ducks. We gotta be better than them. And so that healthy competition came into place and Washington wrote its own trauma legislation. The last set of data that I wanna talk about that, that I hope is convincing that trauma centers and trauma systems saves lives is this study, commonly called the ENSCOT study or the National Evaluation of the Effect of Trauma Center Care and Mortality. El McKenzie, an epidemiologist at Johns Hopkins, Fred Rivara, a pediatrician and myself from the University of Washington, Fred and I, were the co-authors of this work that was funded by uh, funded by a combination of entities, uh, primarily by the CDC, also by the National Institute of um, Aging, um, to look at essentially is trauma care at a level one trauma center really better than a non-trauma center care? We looked at 15 different regions, metropolitan statistical areas around the country. We looked at the 25 largest ones in the country that had uniform hospital discharge databases, selected out the 15 that were going to be key, and, and only included those that had non-trauma center hospitals that saw a significant volume of trauma patients. So we wanted to compare the trauma center hospitals to non-trauma center hospitals, but those non-trauma center hospitals had to have a high enough volume. You can see that map on what the, where this distribution was, fairly good spread throughout the country. We initially looked at 68 trauma centers and 131 trauma centers. We invited them all to participate. You had to get IRB approval from each one of them. We had patient uh, data on each one of them. We ended up with 18 from trauma centers and 51 non-trauma centers that participated in this uh, multi-year long uh, study. Now, you might expect to be really dramatic differences between a trauma center and a non-trauma center. And there were some, but there was some overlap here. For instance, there was a trauma director at 16% of the non-trauma centers. There was a designated trauma team at a third of the non-trauma centers. Now clearly the trauma centers saw more patients, 300 of these highly injured patients. And there were more patients, there were more docs that were in-house that stayed in-house 24-7. But if anything, the non-trauma centers were behaving a bit like trauma centers, just without all of the criteria. So if anything, this data could be exaggerated uh, uh, if there was really a clear difference between the two. We looked at 14,000 discharges um, and 1,135 deaths. We tracked uh, and had data on every single one of the deaths. And we tracked the live discharges for uh, 12 months and 3,400 with uh, phone calls and subsequent calls every three months and six months overall. Uh, sorry, this didn't work out here, but I'll just give you a couple of the key problems with this data. One of the key problems is missing data. Mechanism of injury is missing in 1%, race in 5%, but the real key ones, pre-hospital shock was missing in 26, 27, 28% of the population. 
how you deal with missing data on a data set like this when it's really crucial to have all the data was a key struggle. And we use imputation techniques, a variety of different ones, with some real limits to what we could impute and, and how many times we had to do imputations to believe the data. But that was one of the real struggles with it, one of the real efforts at trying to impute the missing data so that we were left with most complete data. The other part, of course, was balancing disparate populations. The classic, you, wanna, you don't want to compare apples and oranges, you want to compare the same populations. And so if you look in general at the populations that's treated at a trauma center, unadjusted compared to the populations that's treated at a non-trauma center, there are going to be differences. And to accommodate for those differences, we use a variety of different techniques, but then end up primarily using propensity score comparisons to adjust between the two. And on the red, you see with our eventual propensity score analyses, 10 different data sets, 10 different imputations with the data, and then a variety of propensity scores, we ended up with a really nice comparison group after the adjustments to really make these two groups very similar to each other, all the way down, whether it's mechanism injury, the pupils, the GCS motor score, whether they're chemically paralyzed or not, what their overall injury severity score was, their EMS level of care, every variable that we thought would have an effect, we made an adjustment for and try to make sure these two populations were similar. Well, here's the bottom line of that data. Total population of 15,000 patients that we followed over time. Percent dying in a non-trauma center. Now, if you remember, they come in alive, and end up dying. Remember, in the Civil War, it was 25%. In Vietnam, it's down to 1.7%. Civilian population a day in hospital at a non-trauma center is 10%. High, relative to those war categories. That's one important point. Second important point is it's not enough to just look at hospital mortality because people continually die when they leave the hospital. Up to a year out, we saw continuations of this mortality. It went from 9% up to almost 14% at one year out. There's a lot of reasons for that. They get put in skilled nursing facilities and they get shitty care in skilled nursing facilities and they die there. Or they get put in skilled nursing facilities because they have no place else to go and their injuries are so severe that they're going to die from them anyway and it's cheaper in a skilled nursing facility than it is in a hospital. Or the hospitals are no longer making money of them when they're in a hospital because of cavity care, so they want to get rid of them, so they throw them out to any place they can throw them out to and they get their maximum reimbursement after 30, 60 days in a rehab center and then they get thrown out of there. There's a lot of reasons for exploration of this component of why this post-discharge mortality is so high. Now, that's in non-trauma centers. In trauma centers, consistently, at every time part, mortality was between 25 and 35% lower across the board. Matched all these patients, always 20 to 25% lower mortality. And if you look at this a slightly different way, particularly if you look at the younger age population, those less than 55, the more serious your injuries were, the more benefit you had from trauma center care. If you're under the age of 55, and you have a moderately serious, severe injury, and we can define that by an injury severity score, if you're taking, and you have two hospitals, one's a trauma center, one's a non-trauma center, you're 50% less likely to die in the trauma center than a non-trauma center. 50%. That's a high difference in healthcare dollar expenditure, 50% difference. Now, fascinatingly, here's another question for you to ponder. This does not hold up in the elderly. Know that in the elderly, the relative risk of dying in a moderate or serious injury is one. It doesn't matter whether you're treated in a trauma center or a non-trauma center until you're very seriously injured. This is an ISS score greater than 25. Unless you're very seriously injured, then trauma centers show some benefit. Still not statistically significant. You can see those confidence intervals behind there. But there's a great question unanswered yet. Why do trauma centers not provide that same level of benefit for those under 55? that you do for those over 55. A lot of theories about this, but a great, another topic. What's that? You know, the promises provide benefit for those under 55, not for those over 55. Why that is? Real problem because the population is aging in the United States. There are, oh, one, two, three of us over the age of 55 in here. We've got to, got to worry about this. All right, so the National Study on Costs and Outcomes of Trauma and Scott. Overall risk of death, 25% lower in trauma centers compared to non-trauma centers. There are a variety of other papers follow from this, but the other part of it is that significant, there was a significant, modestly, trauma centers increased the quality of life. Their SF36 scores, their functional quality of life was improved, particularly in those with lower extremity fractures. So they save lives, they get you to return to work, they give you more morbidity, less morbidity, 
uh, particularly in serious leg injuries. And in fact, overall, you have about 3.4 lives saved per 100 patients you see. So for every 100 patients that you go to a trauma center versus not, you're saving about three and a half lives. Um, and assume survival in a trauma center not extend beyond one year, but even if it was at one year, the life expectancy, you would gain about 70 life years, about one person, one whole person of life years for every 100 you treat. And if you look at it in qualities, quality of life adjusted years, if you look at those, put those together, make some assumptions about there, and you gain about 70 qualities per 100 patients that you treat as well. So the, the, the trauma centers, I don't have time to go into all the, the money on data, it's, uh, the data on the finance, of, they're expensive. Um, the, 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 the more severely injured you are, the lower the qualities cost. If you're the very severely injured, you can get this down to about $12,000 per quality. Uh, but if you're not so severely injured, then the quality cost goes up quite a bit. But it's in the range of less than dialysis. So I'll just leave it with that. So why are trauma centers better? I'm going to quit pretty soon here and leave you some of these questions. Well, more volume, more practice, better resources, critical care, injury constellations, is the nurses, better laboratory ancillary support, faster times from ER to the OR. We've looked at all of these. But I want to conclude with today with this issue about volume before we go on to these questions part two. I started with that, with, right, with the volume issue all across the board. So I want to talk about the relationship between volume and outcome for trauma. Avery Nathans was a MPH fellow with us at University of Washington a number of years ago. This was his thesis. This is a, this is a pretty good thesis. You write an MPH thesis, you get published in JAMA. That was sort of the goal for every one of our fellows. You see a lot of these have a first author. Those are all a thesis from our MPH fellows. We had about 16 over the 24 years that I was there. So let's look at this. We looked at the University Health System Consortium, a pool of university hospitals. And you take those university hospitals, they're all level one trauma centers. And we divide them into quartiles, low, mid, medium, and high volume trauma center volumes. A low volume trauma center hospital was a university hospital, all university construct, all level one trauma centers. They saw less than 350 major trauma patients per year. High volume saw greater than 650 trauma patients per year. That's a low up to a high volume, divide up in those quartiles. And then we compared their outcome in two different populations. One population was blunt trauma with a head and extremity fracture. The other trauma was a gunshot wound to the abdomen or a penetrating wound to the abdomen with, with isolated either thoracic or abdominal bleeding. So two different very distinct populations. What we found is the following. If you presented to the emergency room from either blunt or penetrating trauma and you weren't in shock, I mean, you were sick, you had a bad injury, but you weren't hypotensive, you weren't on the verge of dying, you weren't in this yelling, screaming, ER television show sort of stuff. You were, you were sick, but you just showed up in the ER. It didn't matter whether you were treated at a low volume or high volume center. Your care was the same. Your mortality was no different. You're adjusted, after you adjusted for a bunch of other factors, overall your mortality was one, whether you're a low volume or high volume. But if you got sick, if you were hypotensive, if you were in shock, if you were in desperate if you, had, if you had squandered that golden hour and you were just about ready to die, this is what happened. The more you saw, the better you got. That the highest volume centers had the lowest mortality by far than the low volume centers. And we saw a cutoff at around a trauma volume of about 650 patients with an injury severity score of greater than 15. All right? Right about here, it became statistically significant. You can see it improves all the way down, but right about here, it becomes statistically significant. So we made that conclusion that, boy, if you're going to be a level one trauma center and you want to really make a difference in those most critically ill patients, you've got to see a lot of volume, and that volume number is 650. Now, that data has been supported by a bunch of other reasons, a bunch of other studies. Here's one out of Quebec. Amoshi Lieberman and John St. Paulus, so friends of mine from, the, from a variety of different reasons, looked at the advantages of developing a trauma system in the entire province of Quebec. I won't go through this in too much detail, but the idea is we know that trauma systems and trauma centers work, but exactly what part of it makes a difference was what we we're trying to explore with this uh, question here. Let me just get right to the meat of this matter. If you look at Quebec, 8 million people, and there's five level one trauma centers. So just do the math on that division, okay? That's about one trauma center for every 1.5 million people. It's in that range. Now you can argue about how many you should have, but that gives you about 1.5. You can see this distribution. Very few level 1s, medium level 2s, more level 3s. It's all distributed where the population is in Quebec, of course, along the U.S. border. And we looked at exclusion, the population, 
There were 72,000 patients were part of this study. 6.2% mortality, once again in that range. Most of it was blunt. Not much penetrating problem in Canada, I eh, poser. Not much. <laughs> Mostly hockey sticks, length of stay, mean deviations, etc. We're primarily interested in mortality, but we also interested in secondary outcomes of length of stay. Now, we looked at a bunch of what we thought were independent variables for predicting outcome. You can see that list here, including whether you had docs in house, whether you had residents, whether you had orthopedics available, whether you had triage protocols, how quickly they called you. It's sort of a shotgun approach to trying to see what makes a difference. What makes a difference? And we did univariate and multivariate and linear and logistic regression analyses. Those are the best tools at that time for looking at what would make a difference in these outcome variables. And this gets at this point of injury mortality makes a difference. Just across the board, their mortality ranged around 0, 2, 3, 4 percent until you hit an ISS of 16. Started to climb a little bit there. When you hit an ISS of 24, boom. That's a severely injured patient population. And we talk about mild, modest, or severe. An injury severity score is a Kermit nomenclature. It scores your injuries. 0 to 9 is mild. 9 to 15 is moderate. 15 to 24 is severe. Greater than 24 is very serious. You can see where this data shows that when you get that break point, that really makes a big difference. Here's the other thing we showed. That a relative risk of 0.43, reasonable confidence intervals, there's a 56% reduction in the risk of dying for every 100 patients you saw increase your volume at a trauma center. So for every 100 more patients you saw, your mortality dropped in half. Another 100, mortality drops in half. Another 100, mortality drops in half. The more you do, the better you get. And for every 100, it's at 50% reductions. And the highest levels of trauma center, the level 1s, it was a 32% reduction for that part as well. And there were a bunch of other things that came into play here. Uh, pre-hospital notification, the triage protocol is being practiced, uh, whether there was performance improvement in program, how much you followed it, a dedicated trauma service, your relationship with research and residencies in your program, all those mattered. But by far and away, the most significant predictor of decreasing mortality was the volume increase per 100 across the board. Same for pediatric trauma centers. I'll skip through that because it shows the same thing. Bottom line, suggested that for a 500, 150 minimum cutoff to be the standard, so you're going to get better outcomes in Peach Trauma Center. So are trauma centers better? Yes. And part of it's because of volume. Is it more resources? Probably not. Better critical care? Yes. Another paper out on that that looked at the ICU and, and what we call salvage. Trauma centers salvage patients. They, they, they get sick in the same degree percentage. They have complications to the same degree percentage. They have bad outcomes to the same degree percentage as non-trauma centers do. But trauma centers do a much better job of salvaging somebody when they're sick. They don't give up on them. They put in the resources to recover them. They have the tools and experience and expertise and inertia and changing manpower and skills and practice to recover someone who's sick. That whole part about, you know, if it's a simple operation that's really fine in the local community hospital, if it gets complicated, you better move granny to the university. That's true. That's what it's about. This is about trying to recover those. So I know my time is up. It's 1 o'clock. I want to tease you with that part. I'm going to quit here just because of the interest of time. I want to go to one slide here, then I'll leave you this question right here. Okay, trauma system designs. Level 1 trauma centers save lives. Trauma centers and trauma systems are excellent examples of regionalizing health care. Trauma centers are most effective for the more severely injured. And in fact, the more severely injured patient you can concentrate in trauma centers, and the higher volume you can get to them, the better they're going to be and the better population is going to be. And that number, about 650, is probably the best number we have right now, but that's the only paper that's out there with a real hard number like that. So it's only one. That I haven't showed you yet, but says that if you're going to transfer from a low volume center, don't go from a 3 to a 2 and then to a 1. Go directly from a th level 3 to a level 1. Don't go intermediary. Jump up. Oregon show this very nicely. Rich Mullins. You're going to transfer from a, from a rural hospital. Skip going to an intermediate one. Go right to the level one if you're going to get them out of there. That makes the biggest difference. And it's not just one component of a trauma center. There are many components that make up a trauma center and a trauma system that are responsible for its improved mortality. It's not as simple as just, well, if we throw a bunch of level ones out there, everything's going to be better. It's much more complicated than that. All right, and then to do this, risk adjustment is essential. Now, when I come back the next time, I'm going to do a comparison between Washington and Oregon. 
in comparison about being the number of trauma centers, the volume that's seen in trauma centers, and the kind of data that's available between these two states to look at a comparison between how two examples of two different states built roughly at the same time with their trauma systems have reached different ways of providing this regionalized health care. So for that, I'll conclude. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for showing up, and I'll stick around if there's any questions afterwards. Thanks, Carol. Part two? Yeah. When are you going to do part two? Whenever Carol finds time for me. Actually, she knows when I'm in town, not operating. We'll try to be seven. Yes, ma'am. This is like a personal question. So, if my child is two. Three? Um, I'm sorry. To a level three? Yeah. And yeah. they want to transfer to a level two. Can I say no? I oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, in almost every state, in fact, in every state, uh, the, the patient has the ability to skip any triage protocol. The patient does have the ability to skip any triage protocol. Yeah, so the patient does. If they're unconscious, then then there are, it's a whole other talk, but um, the, the CDC has sponsored an entire list of criteria for how to make decisions about who to transfer, who to triage, and who to send up. And most states are adopting that CDC written sponsored triage protocol. I haven't shared it, so we can go to what that protocol looks like. But that's, that's, that's very reasonable. But a patient can opt out. So that is unknown. Pete's is a whole different story to agree this is about once. That, that, because there's uh, Pete's trauma center care is based in the United States pretty equally among Pierre Children's Hospitals that do pediatric trauma, which is a minority of children's hospital, mixed adult and pediatric trauma center, where you're designated as both, and Denver Health's example, that's how you use exactly both, and then non designated hospitals would still do, take care of pediatrics. This group here clearly has worse outcomes for a variety of different things. These other two, it's kind of a mix. The, the data is not there how much better a difference they are. That, that, that could go on down forever, but it's pretty good. But anyway, the answer to your question is yes, you can direct where you want. And then so do they automatically? For the most part, in this, in, this, in this state, yes. In most states, yes. If there's one close enough, there are very few designated pediatric trauma centers. In, in, in Colorado, for instance, only two. There's uh, Children's Hospital and there's Denver Health. Those are the only two designated. Which, what that means is that they've gone through all the steps to have an outside group of people, not one, but also who come in and verify and check what they're doing, look at their quality insurance program, look at their PI, look at their trace protocols, look at their staffing, look at all that stuff. Uh, that's a good question. Is it 15 in the state? 15 in the state? Yeah, 0 to 14. Yeah, 0 to 14 inclusive. No. No. And I reference now. <laughs> so you've talked mostly about trauma centers versus non-trauma centers. Yes. Maybe next time I'd be interested to know the difference between level ones. And I can do it. Yeah. Level ones and two is a little bit tricky to talk about um, uh, because there's zero data on the outcome difference between ones and twos, and that's not true. There's there's some that. that there's zero convincing data. There's zero <laughs> level one or level two evidence-based data on the difference between ones and twos, and it, none of it's being none of it's well adjusted. But I can tell you what the American College of Surgeons says should be the difference between ones and twos. Because when when you in this talk when you mm -hmm. talked about trauma centers, you meant level level ones. ones. Yeah, yeah. I'm a level problem. ones. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about what what really an inclusive. Uh, key, key concept behind this is an inclusive system versus an exclusive system. An inclusive system is when you designate every hospital that have some role in a trauma program. They just do their role based on what their resources are and how much they're contributing. And in states that have very inclusive trauma systems, they have level ones, twos, this gives from the highest to the lowest level, ones, twos, threes, fours, and even some states have level five trauma centers. Level five trauma centers typically are uh, uh, are hospitals that aren't staffed by a physician, but are staffed by a nurse practitioner or PA, 
aren't open all the time, just have a call box and just serve as an outpost hospital. In an urban environment, that'd be a crack house with a cell phone. That would be uh, you know, <laughs> five. But in a rural environment, that's what, that's what that amounts to. Most states haven't gone to fives. And in fact, when all this stuff was first talked about, there was only level ones, twos, and threes. Level fours were added on and immediately, and there were very few with level fives. But Iowa is an example of every hospital in the state has to participate in the trauma program. Their state legislature requires them that every state, every hospital, to get state dollars has to be a trauma hospital at some level of care, five, four, three, two, and one. They can decide what level they want to be, but what they, what, why they do that is because that concept behind it is to collect data. If you are a designated trauma center, you have to keep a registry, and you have to turn your registry into a central repository. That's terrific if you actually do something with the data, right? That's, that's data rich and knowledge poor. Right, that's that's what Iowa is. is. Yeah, they get all that, but they do nothing with it. They've never written a single paper, an outcome, or published anything. But what that that does for them, that's a classic example. An exclusive system is where you have one level one for the entire state. Nobody else plays. Just one level one. That's purely exclusive. For a long time, that was Oregon. Oregon had two level ones. They sat across the river from each other. In the city of Portland, there were no other trauma centers in the whole state. If you were on this side of the river, you went to one hospital, and on that side of the river, you went to the other one, and those were a purely exclusive system. It subsequently changed that, but that's an example of purely exclusive. There are advantage and disadvantage of both these two systems, and that's something to talk about later, and what, what the data shows and what's the best way in terms of population-based mortality to make use of that trauma system designs. Next time, you also talk a little bit, just playing devil's advocate. Yeah. Concerns about the focus on trauma centers is you're concentrating the expertise and the skills and the intimate yeah. mind, and that is actually the army really rural. Yeah, well, that's just not true for trauma centers. centers, that's true for all of regionalization of healthcare. Yeah, that, no, that's true, and you do. So there's there's no question that's the case. There's no question. No way you get around that is by transport, by helicopter, or you accept the fact, totally true, it, it's a true fact. The more rural you are, the more likely you are to die of anything, not just injury, anything, anything. It's a price you pay for living in God's country in some ways. That's, that's, no matter what it is, you're more likely to die of cancer, you're more likely to die of breast cancer, you're more likely to die of trauma, you're more likely to die of anything, the more rural you are. Now, now yeah, I have some doubt, I have some doubt on that, what a county with a Lowest motor vehicle crash mortality is versus a county with the highest motor vehicle crash mortality in the United States. That's an example of rural versus urban differences. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And hopefully, the sign-in sheet went around so that we'll be sure you hear about the next, no. the next version. No. Oh. Thank you very much. Thanks. Oh, yeah.